Paris straight to New Jersey. President Trump is back in the U.S. amid new revelations about his son's meeting with a Russian lawyer. And at the Wimbledon women's final, Venus Williams chases another dramatic career record. Plus, he survived severe injuries in Afghanistan. And this week, a new honor for Master Sergeant Israel Del Toro. We'll have his moving story. These stories all ahead here, live from Atlanta. I'm Natalie Allen, and this is CNN Newsroom. U.S. President Donald Trump returned home to the United States on Friday after a whirlwind trip to Paris for Bastille Day. But in his absence, the political firestorm over Russian election meddling grew even larger. At the epicenter, that controversial June 2016 meeting with the president's oldest son and a Russian lawyer who supposedly had dirt on Hillary Clinton. It turns out twice as many people were at that meeting than previously disclosed. Here's the latest now from CNN's Diane Gallagher. This man, a Russian-American lobbyist who one senator has accused of being in Soviet counterintelligence, has been thrust into the center of the Russia investigation. Renat Akhmetshin now tells the Associated Press and other outlets he, too, was in the controversial meeting with the president's son at Trump Tower in June of 2016. Until now, Donald Trump Jr. had said the only people in the meeting were the Russian attorney, Natalia Veselnitskaya, the president's son-in-law and presidential advisor, Jared Kushner, and former Trump campaign chairman, Paul Manafort. So as far as you know, as far as this incident is concerned, this is all of it. This is everything. This is everything. But CNN has learned as many as eight people were in the room, including Akhmetshin, a translator, a representative of the Russian family that initiated the meeting, and Rob Goldstone, the music publicist who set it all up. In one of the emails released by Don Jr., Goldstone writes to him, quote, I will send the names of the two people meeting with you for security when I have them later today. No names were included in the released emails, in which Goldstone promised, quote, some official documents and information that would incriminate Hillary in her dealings with Russia and would be very useful to your father. Akhmetshin is a Russian-American registered lobbyist for Veselnitskaya's organization, focused on overturning an American law that sanctions human rights abusers in Russia, according to lobbying records. In an April letter to Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly, Republican Senator Chuck Grassley described Akhmetshin as a Russian immigrant who has, quote, been accused of acting as an unregistered agent for Russian interest and apparently has ties to Russian intelligence. Akhmetshin denied any of those ties to the Washington Post, saying, I never worked for the Russian government. I served as a soldier for two years. At no time have I ever worked for Russian government or any of its agencies. I was not an intelligence officer. Never. The new disclosure represents yet another version of who was in the room and adds to a growing list of questions about why the story keeps changing. Sources close to Kushner's legal team tell CNN his lawyers and White House aides started coming up with a strategy about how to manage the disclosures of the emails back in late June. Kushner amended his security clearance to include the Trump Tower meeting after his team discovered the emails preparing for his congressional testimony. President Trump maintains he did not know about the meeting until just before his son released the emails and continues to defend him. As far as my son is concerned, my son is a wonderful young man. I think from a practical standpoint, uh, most people would have taken that meeting. But a White House official tells CNN that top advisors know it's not good that the story keeps changing. Diane Gallagher, CNN Washington. Well, while the president's own family has been caught up in this controversy, Mr. Trump was apparently kept in the dark. Here's what his attorney told CNN. The president was not aware of and did not participate of it, and only became aware of the meeting as when we all did. So I, I think we're trying, the meeting was not an issue until what? Emails were released. Here's the legal issue. What law was violated by that meeting? And your experts have said it to nothing. And at the end of the day, that's what this is about. Larry Sabato, director of the Center for Politics at the University of Virginia, joins us now from Charlottesville, Virginia. Larry, thank you for joining us. Um, this is an issue that seems to keep evolving. Now that we know that a Russian lobbyist was also in that now infamous or not infamous meeting, um, why would the Trump team lie about it? Who was there? His lieutenants even praised Donald Trump Jr. for his transparency this week, when now we know he wasn't being transparent. He was covering up. He certainly was. And I think the, the uh, underlying premise was they hoped that this would never be discovered. 
And of course, the irony is um, Donald Trump Jr.'s brother-in-law, Jared Kushner, is really the source of all this, since he had to update his uh, papers for security clearance. Look, uh, this violates the basic rule of scandals that we've talked about really since the beginning of the Trump administration. Drip, 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 dribble, dribble, dribble. That's what you always avoid. You try to get it all out as quickly as possible and actually be transparent. Because if you aren't, you're going to pay for it, just like Donald Trump Jr. and the Trump administration are paying for this now. Well, now, though, that this president has lawyers uh, speaking out for him and trying to explain this, when you somehow you wonder if uh, Seculo um, knows all the facts, uh, seeming to try to uh, explain away this meeting and the mishaps and the missteps surrounding it, with his lawyers uh, now uh, uh, beefing up around him due to the Mueller investigation, one would think maybe they could have an impact with this president. Again, the report is, at least, uh, maybe it's true, maybe it isn't, but the report is that the lawyers also can't contain the president. Uh, they do, as there is their legal responsibility, they outline the facts for the president, they recommend actions, they think he's accepted those recommendations, and then it'll be an hour or two or a day or a week, or it will show up on Twitter that, in fact, he's reversed course. And what of Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, his uh, advisor, and some saying that his uh, security clearance should be revoked after he, for some reason, forgot to mention uh, this meeting and another uh, on the forms he had to fill out? Well, apparently the, the president is effectively the only person who can revoke that security clearance, and I don't think that's going to happen. No, I don't think so. A lot of different reasons, but it will continue to be an issue simply because Trump will not revoke it. There are many people, mainly Democrats, but now some Republicans seem to be having questions about whether Kushner should have that security clearance. Larry Sabato, thank you. Thanks, Natalie. A controversial case in the UK is raising questions about quality of life, government overreach, and the rights of parents when it comes to their children. At the center of it all, a terminally ill child named Charlie Gard. The judge has ruled a U.S. physician can examine the baby next week. That is a possible breakthrough for his parents. Our Erin McLaughlin is in London with the story. 11-month-old Charlie Gard lies in a London hospital can't move his arms or his legs. He can't breathe on his own. His brain damaged, doctors say. Charlie has an extremely rare and fatal genetic disease called mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome. In June, the UK's Supreme Court sided with the hospital caring for Charlie. It ruled experimental treatment is futile. It's in Charlie's best interest to die. A heartbreaking decision and a ruling his parents reject. He's our son, he's our flesh and blood. We feel that it should be our right as parents to decide to give him a chance at life. Now the judge has agreed to hear new evidence that experimental treatment could help. A key question, is Charlie's brain damage reversible? Because without that, what sort of life could Charlie lead? A New York-based medical expert testified that new research shows with treatment, there is a small but significant chance of improvement in Charlie's brain function. And so in light of this new research, the judge has asked all sides, the experts, the hospital, the parents, to get together to try and reach a consensus on what's best for Charlie. It's a case that sparked international interest with tweets from Pope Francis and President Trump, a powerful U.S.-based anti-abortion organization and a controversial reverend now working with Charlie's parents. The help of putting a campaign together, getting petitions, uh, we're in constant contact with the White House. Things at times have become heated, anonymous threats made against the hospital and the judiciary. But the judge in this case insists he will not be swayed by tweets. He wants to see new and concrete evidence Charlie's life can improve. Otherwise, the original ruling stands. Aaron McLaughlin, CNN, London. And we'll have more news right after this.
Dubai Healthcare City, we're working at the forefront of global medical innovation, transforming lives through education and research. A relative of mine was sick, and seeing her trust in the doctors inspired me to become a doctor myself. Students have entered this field to learn not only how to treat future patients, but also how to care for them. I really enjoy applying whatever I learned in class in a hospital setting. My name is An innovative academic experience is enhanced through hands-on practice in our state-of-the-art simulation center. I'm surrounded by all these great doctors and professionals, so to be able to attend a brand new medical university like the Mohammed bin Rashid University of Medicine and Health Sciences is a great opportunity. We are creating a destination for education and research, preparing the doctors of tomorrow. Despite all the hard work, I really do enjoy the student life. Dubai has so much to offer. All new African Voices. This week, these determined musicians are hitting the right note with their fans at home and abroad. Our songs are going to resonate across the globe. African Voices, tonight on CNN. Sunday. Donald Trump Jr.'s Russia meeting. The president says it was nothing. Zero happened from the meeting. But Congress is not satisfied. Will the younger Trump be forced to testify? State of the Union with Jake Tapper, Sunday on CNN. This is the edge of the old city of Mosul, where the most intense fighting against ISIS has been. Minute by minute, ISIS appear to be running out of ammunition, handing themselves in. Iraq's Prime Minister Haider al Abadi arriving in Mosul to declare victory here. They are asking how many people are dismissed from work, how their needs will be met from now on. Let them work in the private sector. Why should we care? Will we think about them? Let them work in the private sector. Will the state look after them? The state looked after them, and they betrayed the state. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan speaking there about a purge of government workers. Turkey is marking one year since a failed coup to end his rule. There are reports that more than 7,000 police, academics, and civil servants have just been dismissed. Well, one year later, a state of emergency remains in Turkey, and as we've just heard, the crackdown against perceived government opponents has not let up. Some 150,000 people have been detained. They include teachers, judges, and soldiers. About one-third of them, some 50,000, have been arrested, and at least 179 media outlets have been shut down. That is since the coup of July 2016. Events to mark the failed coup anniversary are planned across Turkey. A national unity march is set for later in Istanbul, despite the country's political division. And our ghoul to Zeus now has the story of a mother who defied soldiers when they were trying to overthrow the president last year. Few people knew Safiya Bayat before this moment. She led a seemingly quiet and simple life. But this conservative mother of two surprised even herself. During the coup attempt last year, when she stood up to tanks and soldiers. She said she made a split-second decision that night when she turned on the TV, that she would go out to confront the soldiers trying to topple the government of Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. She says as a woman, she thought she might be able to stop the soldiers and appeal to their conscience. But they only had anger and violence in return, she tells us. She says when she wouldn't leave, they threatened to shoot her. I told them I wasn't afraid of them, she says. They roughed me up, but I kept saying I am not afraid and that they could shoot me if they wanted to. When soldiers began firing on the crowd, Bayat says she was shot in the leg while trying to carry away the wounded. A strong supporter of Turkey's president, Bayat is glad to see those who she believes are responsible for the coup behind bars. And while many in Turkey are united behind Turkey's president, for others, the post-coup Turkey has become an intolerably oppressive place. 
Since the coup attempt, the government has declared a state of emergency. More than 100,000 people have been detained or arrested. Tens of thousands of workers, including civil servants, teachers and journalists, have been dismissed from their jobs. Critics of the government say that the post-coup crackdown has turned into a cleansing of all voices of dissent, with both the coup and the crackdown leaving scars on an already fractured nation. Gultusu's CNN, Istanbul. Our next story is from California. There was a poignant moment at this week's ESPY Awards in Los Angeles. The event typically brings together the world's greatest pro athletes, but it was this U.S. service member who received a standing ovation. U.S. Air Force Master Sergeant Israel Del Toro accepted the Pat Tillman Award for service. Del Toro's vehicle rolled over a roadside bomb in Afghanistan in 2005. Third-degree burns covered more than 80% of his body, and doctors gave him only a slim chance of survival. But Del Toro fought through. In 2010, he became the first fully disabled airman to re-enlist in the Air Force. Here's what he said after accepting his award. Receiving this award is still strange for me. I don't see myself as someone special. I just did what any other service member would do. Make things better for the guys that follow him and to take care of teammates. Del Toro also spoke with CNN's Jake Tapper about the significance of the award. It was strange. It, it really was because you know, like I said it in my speech, and you know, I don't see myself as anyone special. You know, I was just doing my job. So to be honored, especially by, you know, Marie Tillman and the Tillman Foundation to, for this award, is just, it was an amazing feeling because he, he's somebody, I, Pat Tillman was someone I admired. You know, he he was like players of old that gave up his, uh, his career to go serve his country. You know, the true meaning of serve for self. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like how people in World War II would leave their f very famous careers at home and then go fight, I, I agree. In 2012, um, you talked to CNN about the moment that your son saw you after the blast. Y you worried uh, that he would be afraid of you. Thankfully, that didn't happen. It has been almost 12 years since that, that horrific ambush. Wh what's been the hardest part of your recovery? Uh, you know, I think the hardest part is maybe I can't really play baseball with my son like I wanted to. You know, I was a big baseball player, and yeah, I could do what I can with him, but it, it just, it sucks I can't really play catch. You know, especially, everyone thinks of Father's Day. Father's Day is when you're out in the backyard playing catch with your dad, and you know, I, I really can't do that. He, could, he throws it back at me, but throws it at my feet so I can stop, and then I pick it up and throw it back at him. But. You know, I think that's probably the hardest part out of anything I've, you know, since my injury. I'm sure that game of catch is pretty special, um, even if it's not what you want it to be. Um, you have re-enlisted, and you are now serving as an Air Force training instructor. Um, what is the message that's most important to you to get across to your fellow airmen uh, whom you now mentor? Well, you know, it, it, my, my thing is, is uh, you know, don't, don't let little things bug you. You know, as long as you stay positive and uh, clear in your head, you can accomplish anything. You can overcome any obstacles, no matter how hard it may seem. You know, just find that sparks, find that fire. Like, you know, everyone has a different one. Mine was my son. You know, he was my fire, he was my spirit. Uh, so that's what I try and tell, you know, all my airmen, all, all the cadets there at the Air Force Academy that, you know, I, I know it may, it may suck right now, but just stay positive, you'll get, you'll get through it. You were honored at the ESPYs, of course, because of your connection, not only to service, but to sports. Athletics uh, has become a huge part of your life. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, when I was going through my recovery, you know, most of us are very, you know, guys that get wounded, you know, most of us are, are athletic, and we sometimes think we can't play sports anymore. And that's what I thought also, but when they are introduced me to the adaptive sports uh, out there at, at BAMC, at the Senate, uh, Center of the Intrepid Center, yes, C CFIs. <laughs> Whatever it is, okay, yeah. So, there you go, Center for the Intrepid. Uh, sorry, get blown up, you forget things, you know. <laughs> I understand. But, uh, and they start introducing you to these things, these new sports. I never did track and field. 
So they start doing, you can do this, you know, you can do shooting, sitting volleyball, you know, air rifle, precision shooting. And I'm thinking, how am I gonna do air rifle precision shooting? You know, if you look at my hands, I'm like, I'm missing a couple fingers. It's like, no, it gets all adapted. And it, you start feeling like yourself again. And, and, and it, it was, it was a big part of my recovery to get back out there, face the world, and start living my life with my family. Israel Del Toro, what an inspiration. Well, after a quick break, Venus Williams takes center court at Wimbledon. What makes this final so special for her after such a decorated career? We'll tell you next. The best sailors on the planet sailing the fastest race boats ever built. Six teams battling it out head to head in a winner takes all fight to claim the most elusive prize in sailing. It is, of course, the 35th America's Cup. And this month on Main Sail, we're finally going to find out who's going to win the oldest trophy in world sport. Main Sail, next on CNN, in partnership with Rolex. and divers in the world meet for the most important competition in aquatic sports this year. Join me, Christina McFarlane, in Budapest, Hungary for CNN's coverage of the FINA World Championships. Thursday on CNN. Somebody to, to tell you their story, it's, it's something I take really seriously. And it's not something you can just parachute in and ask somebody to open their heart to you. To peel away the layers, to get to the heart of the person who you're telling a story about. France will never give up against the tourists. And delve beneath the surface of what's happening. You can hear their story, and you're going to do their story justice. You have to show yourself to them. How high was the water? The water was as, as tall as that tree. CNN is the right place to tell their story. After her debut at the All England Club, 20 years, can you believe that? Venus Williams is back at Wimbledon. And it should come as no surprise, she will be playing for the coveted Grand Slam title in just a few hours from now. She will have to get through a rising star, though, in Garbina Muguruza. But as our Christina McFarlane reports, Venus is chasing history. At 37, Venus Williams is back on top. Striding into centre court Saturday, hoping for her sixth Wimbledon singles title, she is poised to become the oldest women's Grand Slam champion in the Open era, ready to silence the sceptics who muse that she would be too old to win again. I feel quite uh, capable, to be honest, and powerful. I have an opportunity to bank on experience and, and having dealt with those sort of pressures before. Perhaps it's that experience that has allowed Williams to stay focused on her game despite considerable emotional turmoil heading into the tournament. In June, Williams was involved in a tragic car accident in Florida that led to the death of 78-year-old Jerome Barson, his family filing a wrongful death lawsuit against the tennis champion. The initial police report found Williams at fault for the accident, but surveillance video caused police to revise their findings, ruling instead that Williams acted lawfully. Williams shared her sadness about the crash on her official Facebook page. I am devastated and heartbroken by this accident. My heartfelt condolences go out to the family and friends of Jerome Barson, and I continue to keep them in my thoughts and prayers. When asked about the incident following her first round Wimbledon win, Maybe I go. Yeah. she broke down. Williams regained her composure, channeling her energy onto the court, beating much younger opponents, three of whom were born the year she debuted at Wimbledon. It's not the first time Williams has had to transcend pain to compete. After years of battling debilitating fatigue that affected her ability to play at the elite level, Williams was diagnosed with the autoimmune disease Sjogren's syndrome in 2011. Many thought it meant the end of her tennis career. But Williams vowed to do whatever it took to return to the game. When you don't feel well and things are taken away from you, it's hard to stay positive. But for me, it's not an option to get negative or to feel sorry for myself. 
Defying the odds, Williams reached the finals in two Grand Slam tournaments this year for the first time since 2003, losing to sister Serena in the Australian Open in January. On the court, we are mortal enemies, but the second we shake hands, it's, it's, it, we are best friends again. And Serena's bombshell you know, announcement that she won the match while expecting me, meant there wouldn't be a chance for a rematch between so the sisters at Wimbledon. I, like, I just wish she was here, and I was like, I wish she could do this for me. I was like, no. This time, if you do it for yourself. <laughs> Serena, due to give birth in late August, early September, will have to cheer her big sister on from afar, joining millions who tune in to see whether 37 year old Venus Williams will become a champion once again. And we'll know later today if she does. Uh, some some interesting news, though, to tell you about Wimbledon this year. The winner's payout will be down a bit by about $100,000 compared to last year. The reason? Well, it's all due to exchange rates after the 2016 Brexit vote sent the British pound plummeting. But the top prize of $2.8 million will still be handed out to someone. It's, it's interesting. Does that Not mean that they, they get paid in dollars or do they get paid in pounds? It's, I guess it's all about the conversion. It's then, all right? about the conversion. Interesting, huh? Best Don't thing. pepper me with those <laughs> <laughs> complicated Last minute questions. questions. Sorry, all right, that. Derek is here. We're going to talk weather at yeah. Wimbledon. Yeah, you know, um, they're coming off of one of the warmest summers, at least since 1976 in southern England. So this is actually impacting the grass, believe it or not, on the courts. And uh, they've had... Not an, much of it. Not much of it, right. It's a completely down and when you have extremely dry grass you can imagine what that means for the court could be actually dangerous especially if you get a little bit of light rain on the uh, courts uh, well unfortunately it looks as if we do have the chance of some light rain across this region here's the latest radar across the United Kingdom and well, any time you see that kind of scattering of light blues just outside of London, there are a few showers in the vicinity. Nothing heavy. We're still a few hours away from the women's final taking place uh, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, this morning, uh, in the afternoon hours here in London, I should say. We will keep the forecast dry, but we'll leave that small 20% chance of rain showers in the forecast for today. Of course, we've got the men's finals taking place on Sunday. Uh, cloudy conditions there, maybe a passing shower. It's just a little too close to call, but uh, we do have a few weak frontal boundary systems moving across southern England as we speak, and that's why we see that scattering of showers right now on the latest radar. Now, it's not only the Wimbledon Championship that's taking place right now. We've got the Tour de France, stage 14 and 15 across uh, southern sections of France, and while the weather looks picture perfect, blue skies overhead, we have no rain in this forecast for the fans taking part and also uh, the athletes that are uh, competing for this monumental, monumental challenge. Look at the um, unbelievable elevation gain, though, across that area. It is really incredible to watch that if you get the chance. Now, the forecast here, really staying dry across France. The big story has been the heat, though. Look at these temperatures, upper 40s for places like Madrid. Uh, I should say lower to middle 40s, and uh, we're talking about seven degrees above average. Fortunately, we will cool things off here in the coming days. All right. Thank you, Derek. Happy watching. Yep. We'll be watching Wimbledon. We Thanks for watching us, and we'll be right back with our top stories.